Well, welcome everyone. I'm Philip Martin. And um, you're joining us for this sixth edition of our monthly Beyond the Page book club. Today I'm joined by Edie Hurst Jr., author of How to Educate a Citizen, The Power of Shared Knowledge to Unify a Nation. Special recognition to Trident Books, booksellers and cafe who partnered with Beyond the Page book club on this event. Trident is open for curbside pickup and uh, limited capacity in, book, in store browsing. You can visit them in the store, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week, or on their website 24 seven. Now, before we get started, I want to explain how this will work. I know many of you may be new to, to Zoom. If you, you won't see yourself on video and you will not be able to speak during the author interview, but we do want you to hear from, we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. You can put your questions in at any point in time during my interview with, uh, uh, with uh, my man, ED. I'll include them after our discussion. Let me say, first of all, it is my pleasure to introduce E.D. Hurst. Uh, and let me tell you a few things about uh, Mr. Hurst. He's the founder and chairman of the Core Knowledge Foundation and Professor Emeritus of Education and Humanities at the University of Virginia. He's the author of several acclaimed books on education, including the New York Times bestseller, Cultural Literacy, The Schools We Need, The Knowledge Deficit, The Making of Americans, and Why Knowledge Matters. He's a highly regarded literary critic and professor of English earlier in his career, and he's persisted as a voice of reason, making the case for equality of educational opportunity. Uh, first of all, <laughs> E.D., uh, welcome. Thanks, glad to be here. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> can, can you hear me? The power, the power of Zoom. I mean, <laughs> it's 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 become the go-to uh, in this uh, during this during the pandemic. Um, your name, by the way, conveys gravitas. I think I, I mentioned that to you at the very beginning of our discussion, and so I just want to give you props for that. Why did you write this book? Of, and let me show folks. If I assume everyone's read it. <laughs> How to Educate a Citizen with the subtitle, The Power of Shared Knowledge to Unify a Nation. More on that later. I have a, I gotta have a few devil's advocates question for you too, E.D., but why, why this book? Why now? Well, uh, I, 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 two things. Uh, nothing much had happened uh, after writing my prior books. So I, try, I thought I'd try again because I've been singing sort of the same song ever since I happened to uh, be reading in psycholinguistics and just a combination of, of specialties that I had made me realize what had gone wrong in our elementary schools. And then the, the other reason that really uh, it rather excited me was for new work in uh, brain studies which uh, threw a good deal of light on the things that we had already observed empirically, but in fact, uh, were now pretty well ascertained. And I can go into that. I won't go <laughs> make a long speech, but that was basically why I thought now the, with this new research, uh, the, it's pretty, it ought to be pretty convincing to everybody why we have to change the way we teach our young children. So is this sort of a marriage between linguistics uh, and, uh, if you will, English and cultural literacy? Well, uh, cultural literacy was the first uh, rendition of this because one of the things that was discovered in psycholinguistics was the need for the unsaid to be known by both parties to, to the conversation and speech. Speech never speaks its own meaning. And you know, the, at, everybody was in my day when I was doing this, of course, I'm pretty antique now, but in, at the time I was doing it, everybody was interested in Chomsky and the formal universals of language. But it turns out that there's also a content universal of language. And that is language never speaks its whole meaning. You have to have relevant background knowledge in both parties to the speech in order to make the speech understandable. 
It never is completely unambiguous or explicit. You mentioned Chomsky. Uh, of course, there's also Andrea Morrow uh, in in talking and <laughs> talking about uh, the prominence of uh, of the of language of English uh, in. And of course, it's somewhat of a chauvinistic view uh, in uh, in basically determining what is central to um, what is central to. Uh, 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 I'm going to confuse this. Going to confuse the theory. So let me let me back away from that altogether. Let me just ask you this question. You one of the things I found really interesting is uh, your emphasis on on public education and the notion of. Um, the notion that uh, it's public education that that leads this this very common notion of uh, now a common notion certainly not a common notion uh, in the 1850s of broad educational achievement for all students of whatever all meant in 1850s of course there were a lot of people excluded can you talk about your concerns for public education or the marriage of public education uh, and the centrality, if you will, of a of a common uh, of common literacy and a uncommon education. Well, I think every I don't have to make a pitch. I think for literacy, since you mentioned literacy, everybody I believe I, it, that would waste a lot of time because I think everybody agrees that uh, people should read and write, uh, particularly in a democracy where you are. Or a participant governor yourself. Well, we agree. We agree, we agree on that now. But there were a lot of people excluded from the notion oh, of universal reading and writing. <laughs> that, goes, that, that goes without saying. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, in the North, there is a distinction between the North and the, and the South in that respect. And so, in the 1850s and before, long before that, uh, there were plenty of people in the North who, who want to include Blacks and, uh, and the generality of all people in public education, as you, as you well know. And, and you mentioned 1850, that's rather late. It was started even earlier, uh, uh, the idea of universal education in the North. Well, Daniel Webster had already advanced this notion, correct? Uh, and- Noah, the Noah. I'm sorry, Noah Webster. My apology. Oh, now, so the, que the one one question about Webster's: uh, you, at the same time that the Americas were pushing for um, the notion of uh, public education for all, uh, again with an emphasis on what all represented, of uh, the Prussians had already uh, uh, had already achieved this notion, correct? The Prussians, well, uh, yes, but uh, mind you, Boston deserves a lot of credit. You're, you're in Boston and uh, in Massachusetts, long before 1850, the, the date you mentioned, uh, there was education, public education for all people, and certainly including Blacks, uh, and uh, compulsory as a matter of fact. That was another feature of early, uh, early education in the United States. It was compulsory. And, and Massachusetts was a leader in that way. Now, this is not only an academic book, but it's a call to to action. Of uh, is I think how you you framed this. Why why now? Why uh, do you see this? Uh, I mean, we we can have a lot of obvious obvious thoughts about why we've never been. I mean, we've had a lot of uh, moments of disunity in the country across across the breadth of the country's history, but now it seems particularly um, uh, disunited, ununited. Is this part of your uh, uh, motivation in writing this book? Yes, and I, I follow in the footsteps of a, of a lot of uh, prophetic writers, particularly Arthur Schlesinger, whom I Junior, whom I quote, oh, yes. he wrote a book called The Disuniting of America. Mm -hmm. And uh, my uh, thesis is that a big contribution to uh, the sense of alienation that we have and the sub-tribes that uh, make themselves so emphatically felt these days is uh, that as the years rolled on from really about 1940 or so, uh, 
progressive education took over our elementary schools and people became less and less literate. But what that meant was that people uh, did not communicate with one another. And when they don't, don't communicate well with one another because of this lack of shared background knowledge, then uh, they tend to form sub-tribes. Uh, and, and these sub-tribes, if you don't have a common tribe, as it were, or a super tribe, then the nation gets disunited. And of course, I mentioned Noah Webster because the founders were very aware of, of this problem uh, because they had seen the breakup of all other large empires, they called it because of the, the various states were, were autonomous. Uh, they considered the United States a kind of empire and the Roman empire was collapsed because of these internal tribal uh, uh, disputes uh, was a big model for the founders. That's why unity, unity was the big, <laughs> right at the beginning of the constitution, unity was. It's, it's, such, it's such an enormous concept, unity, uh, especially when it's juxtaposed against the reasons why we are so uh, disunited, if you will, uh, our, our history. Now, how do you how do you deal uh, with those who are going to ask you, and they, I'm sure you've been asked already, if you already have an interpretation of historical reality, uh, that, for example, posited by the authors of 1619, and those basically who, who militate against that interpretation of historical of, of reality, what, not seeing it as objectively uh, real in, historically, uh, uh, in a historical context, how do you basically achieve the, uh, the notion of consensus? Well, one thing I would point out to them is, is that, well, first of all, there were always two parties. There were the anti-slave party and the pro, pro slave party. So 1619 was not everybody uh, after 1776 who, who formed the country. Uh, there, there were not, I, 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 it's interesting to be having this conversation in, in with Massachusetts, which, right. uh, which is such a, <laughs> which is, which is a, a good example of the good guys, uh, maybe largely because the Quakers were so prominent, but in any case, or, or at least the uh, dissenters from Britain, because they, they were, you know, they were very aware of the underdog. And they were wonderful people. I mean, I, I have just been reading a long biography of, uh, of Frederick Douglass, who of course uh, ended up in Massachusetts. Uh, and uh, he, right. uh, he, uh, he was buddy with John Brown, who was a sort of heroic uh, uh, character. So, that, so I, I don't wanna paint everybody with the same 1619 brush. Uh, the, in 1776, there were good guys and there were bad guys. Anyway, so the, the aim has always been, and we still have that, needless to say. They're, they're, the, they're the dividers uh, and the unifiers uh, who, who want to treat everybody equally today. And I, I think it's very interesting because uh, in, in the current political crisis, uh, which we have, uh, you can see one party is is setting one group against another, and the other party is saying we're all Americans, and and actually that was one of the motivations of this book that we we're we're all Americans idea. You already sensed the questions uh, in in many ways that I'm asking, uh, and one, and I tell you that because on page uh, one seventy four, you ask this this question, uh, Ed. You ask. Um, you say, you say defenders of the status quo often ask who should decide what we should all know. That is supposed to be a conversation stopper. The unaccept, unex, unexceptionable answer would be the majority should decide as is normal in a democracy. But perhaps that's not what who decides actually means. So what does who decides actually mean for those who are still reading how to educate a citizen? Well, uh, what, what I would say is that uh, you have to look at the, con the constitution says education belongs to the states. 
And so the, who decides is therefore the, the people have the legal power in the public schools to decide. And that would be the individual state. So I think it's state legislatures and governors. Those are the people who by law should decide what our schools should teach. They are given that power by the constitution and they, the legislature certainly are representative of the people. So the people do decide that way. But that's where you run into problems, isn't it? Uh, recall, the, <laughs> recall the Texas uh, textbook uh, uh, debate, uh, for example, uh, in the 1990s, where Tex, uh, Texas committee, a committee based in Texas, was basically determining what and uh, what was history and what history should be taught. Uh, many in the North considered it revisionist. Uh, talk about uh, and that becomes an obvious conflict. Uh, when you're right. trying to determine, uh, again, objective reality, historically speaking? Well, yeah, I would say there that it's it, one reason for writing a book like this is to get Texas to fall in, in line with the rest of us. I mean, the point, uh, the point of the, the book and the point of the early theorists of education in the United States uh, was uh, union, unity. That was to form a more perfect union was the aim. And, but to do that, you have to have the states cooperating. How, how are you going to? And so the who decides question is a rhetorical and a political one ultimately. And uh, I guess what we're, and so people who want to engage in that. And by the way, I did engage in it. I, I came out with a book because I had interviewed uh, a lot of people over a long period over what literate, articulate, successful people in the US did know. And, and therefore that has a certain stability to it. And therefore, what should, I, should our schools teach? If particularly, I think you have to bring parents into this in the who decides question, particularly with elementary schools because parents flock to these core knowledge schools, which are based on that kind of idea, it's what successful people know that we want our kids to know also, right? And uh, there are theorists who have a, a different point of view, but they, but they never set out a curriculum. Uh, and so uh, the parents are flocking to these schools that do this. And I think maybe for young kids, maybe that's a good answer. It hadn't occurred to me before, but who decides? Well, parents should have a voice for sure. I think you've taken on an incredible topic uh, because of the, the enormity of the obstacles in, in achieving uh, the notion of a of a education and how to educate a citizen. That's quite, quite a task. Let me folks, uh, folks, if you've just joining us, uh, we are continuing a conversation with Edie Hirsch, author of How to Educate a Citizen, uh, including uh, Philip here who confused Daniel and Noah uh, Webster a few minutes ago, and I'm glad uh, we're able to set that straight. A reminder, if you want to ask uh, Mr. Hirsch questions, uh, please use the Q&A tab uh, that's located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we will uh, get to those questions after our interview. Uh, so, Mr. Hurst, uh, let me ask you, if when you say the power of shared knowledge to, to unify a nation, I'm thinking about, I'm focused right now on power, the power of, why is, uh, why would shared knowledge represent something that is indeed powerful? Uh, if, 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 again, you, you consider the multiple co contradictions uh, that, uh, that many people presuppose in in this question of, of unity? Yeah, I think that to, we need to go back into almost into evolutionary psychology here. I mean, the, what is it that makes for unity, particularly in a large diverse country? And I think it's a kind of tribal uh, patriotic feeling. Uh, we're all in this together kind of feeling and uh, we're willing to sacrifice for the other person uh, because they belong to our tribe, our, our great big tribe, our super tribe. And that was built into human psyche by evolution because 
uh, there's a very good book uh, by Hirari called uh, Sapiens. I, uh, I, I, I'm sure many of your readers or listeners have, have read it, but it's, it's looking at human development from an evolutionary standpoint. And the reason, the reason we have sub-tribes is that that tribal instinct is very strong in our psyches. Everybody grants it. It's, this is not news to, to anybody. And the difficulty is in creating a tribe, a tribal sense of patriotism in a large diverse society. And for that to happen as a minimum, there has to be shared knowledge and shared values among the participants, because that's chiefly what creates uh, loyalties, our willingness to work for the benefit, our willingness to pay higher taxes, just to give a, a really concrete example. Uh, everybody, I mean, the idea that it's virtuous to try to avoid paying uh, taxes is uh, quite bothersome. And, and, and there was greater patriotism in the United States. Uh, well, see, I'm so old that maybe it isn't recognizable to you, but there was tremendous patriotism as one grew up in the 30s and the 40s. And, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please go on. No, uh, I'm just saying that I think we have to reignite this sense, this um, more tribal sense of the country, because otherwise you have, uh, if you it, disunify yourself into uh, separate tribes or warring tribes or hostile tribes, uh, you really do injure yourself uh, in, in the modern era. And so we need to get back together uh, as patriots. Um, that's that's one of the that's the final chapter is called Patriot. There's something there's something very noble about your about this the aspiration behind how to educate a citizen because again as a journalist I look out there uh, in this in this world of ours and this and this in this sci-fi moment uh, during this pandemic for example and even during a, this pandemic you see extraordinary disunity of uh, the very meaning of uh, of of one's health and and the health of the nation uh, is being debated. Uh, so uh, when you're when we're at that point of uh, uh, and you posit how to educate a citizen again you're 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 basically making your way through of uh, these uh, all these various prisms and cages and areas and zones where people are situated right now right. Um, in, so in doing your research did you find a point where, folks are united, not just, of course, at the start of World War II, not just at the start, not just right after a 9-11, not just after uh, uh, a horrible uh, winter storm. Uh, have you found places where people have been able to unite and where we can perhaps hope that uh, well, yes, citizenship I mean, will come together? Uh -huh. I, I think, I, I think in, in one sense, uh, the uh, George Floyd uh, marches where that that instinct came out. I, I I felt it. It gave that gave me moments of help. It's incipient. This is what people want, I think, and uh, I think we've had some wrong ideas which have injured that unity. Uh, and I think also we're not communicating with one another very uh, very forcefully, very well, uh, because elementary schooling. Took a wrong test. Now, mind you, this <laughs> what you're calling a noble aim. Well, it's a it's a traditional American aim, but on the other hand, uh, it's very long range considering the urgency of a lot of our problems right now. But you do have to start with young kids. That's that's where it begins, and that's sort of where it ends. As as far as your for example, let me give you one quick example. Please. When, whether, whether you're going to college or not is largely determined in elementary school because that is where our elementary middle school, those years mm -hmm. up through to grade eight, pre-high school, 
that's determining the education you, you receive in, in those years determine whether you go to college. Whether you go to college or not, and particularly there, there are all ranges of, of kinds of college, that determines uh, a heck of a lot about how you make out in American society. So elementary school is a very important time if equality is your aim. So I admit it's long range, but on the other hand, that's where you have to start. And I think that's something to be hopeful about. I think that uh, I'm hoping that educators and those who make uh, these decisions are reading how to educate a, a citizen. Have you had any luck in, in basically getting these ideas into the hands and the heads of those who make those decisions? Well, it's early days. We're so preoccupied with the election. The, the book came out in, uh, what was it, September. The book, book came out in early September. And, and everybody was so preoccupied, including the author, me, uh, with, the, with the election, that uh, it's hard to think about elementary school. On the other hand, uh, parents are in the situation where they have to uh, educate their children at home or deal with uh, children who, I heard the Boston schools just a, few, a couple of days ago just closed down again. Yes, sir. Well, I, let, let me insert a, a, a little hopeful hint, it's, uh, it, and that is uh, if parents, uh, at least at the elementary level up through eighth grade, are uh, uh, middle school and elementary, uh, they can go to the Core Knowledge website and get free materials for, for, the, for their kids, which will at least uh, help out a bit uh, in, in those early grades. Uh, uh, but. Yes, I mean, this, I think this is a darn good time to be rethinking elementary education. I've seen some, I see some great questions have come in and we're going to be able to, we're going to get to those in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, let me just say um, at this point that I'd like to introduce the team behind tonight's uh, event. Uh, they are managing the technology and connecting with you, but you won't see or hear them. Uh, Jen Gilchrist is our event producer overseeing the whole virtual production. Jen, come on and uh, say hello if you don't mind. Hi everyone, I'm producing tonight's event. Thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, and I look forward to seeing where the rest of this conversation goes. And Suzanne is keeping an eye on our Q&A question box. Suzanne, come on out and say hello. Oh, okay. Well, I want to thank both of you. Now let's hear from uh, Sandy Chen. She's the Associate Director of GBH Leadership Circle Giving. That's, uh, that's a mouthful, Sandy. Sandy will explain how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the page, but all the virtual events we continue to provide. Um, Sandy? Oh, I think. Hi, oh, there you Philip. go. Philip, thank you so much. Hi everyone, thank you so much for spending some time with us during tonight's virtual Beyond the Page event. The great thing about books and GBH is the fact that both are commercial free and GBH is hugely member supported. That means we're here because you want us here. Our commercial free status also means we count on your support. Now, if you've already done your part, thanks. Thank you for supporting quality public broadcasting. And if you haven't, well, here's your chance. When you give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining mm -hmm. member, we'll say thanks with an autographed copy of next month's Beyond the Page book selection, Bestiary by K. Ming Chang, as a token of our appreciation. You can see that right here. Uh, our next event is November 17th, so you can certainly look forward to that. And as we navigate this ever-changing reality, financial support from our donors keeps us going strong become a sustaining member at $5 a month or give $60 all at once, whatever works for you. It's easy to support what you love. Please go to gbh.org slash support events and click on that link and contribute what you can. Thanks again. Now let's get back to Philip. Thanks, Andy. It's, uh, it's time for your questions, folks. Uh, remember, use the Q&A function. No need to wait. Uh, jump right in and ask your questions. Um, again, I'm talking to Edie Hirsch, Jr., uh, How to Educate a Citizen, The Power of Shared Knowledge to, unify, to Unify a Nation. 
uh, powerful words to unify a nation. Uh, some of your questions reflect, again, the, um, uh, the, the concern about how do you do that? How do you go about do it, doing that? Uh, from Melanie, uh, we're, we have this question. Would a logical ex extension of the thesis of this book be that the community must also help immigrant children acquire English skills as soon as possible, and she has in parentheses, versus investing time teaching content in the student's native language. Edie? Oh, I think that's a, a, that's a wonderful question, uh, but, but uh, obviously they have to go in tandem, but uh, what age are you talking about? Uh, you see, I mean, if you're talking about immigrant children who are already pretty advanced in grade level in their own uh, native language and don't know any English, it, of course, that's a double problem. And by the way, I'm not an expert in that. I don't know. But my general is, is sense is that parents who come to the United States with very young children want them to uh, learn English as soon as possible. It's the lingua franca, it's the general language that we have in this country, and its language is absolutely essential to the, to the tribal feeling that, uh, as a matter of fact, that is the reason we evolved language, was so that we could, I mean, apes go in rather solitary uh, groups. We evolved language so we could have big tribes and big tribes could kill dinosaurs and, and other less fortunate creatures because they would work in tandem. So common language is absolutely fundamental to, to human cooperation. But can, those, can languages exist side by side? Let's take, let's take for example, in Canada, uh, where, where the Quebecois have been successful in introducing in, in Quebec, for example, a, both a French and an English curriculum. Uh, there's a lot of disunity also, uh, but uh, in the United States, can Spanish and English exist side by side in, in terms of uh, this thesis and in terms of the goals you're trying to achieve educating a citizen? Well, I, I, I think bi I like to talk in terms of bilingualism rather than uh, so I was, uh, the best example of that kind of question is Switzerland, uh, which is, uh, uh, and it's an interesting example because it was taken in two different directions by the theorists of multiculturalism. Uh, uh, Howard Callan in the 20s was the real, uh, what we say, the origin of the ideas about multiculturalism in the United States. And what happened in Switzerland is terribly interesting, and I use that as a, uh, an epigraph. Uh, one of the three epigraphs to the book was a, an excerpt from Carl Deutsch, uh, Language and Society. I, I, that in Switzerland, where they have four national languages, uh, uh, well, and lately, of course, the the common language is English, which is a, which is a fifth one. But, but Deutsch's point was rather subtle. And that is this tremendous unity and patriotism in uh, Switzerland, it, despite the persistence of these four languages. But the reason is that they're all learning the same things. And in fact, when they communicate in French, say, or, or that one is speaking German, the other is speaking French. When they communicate, they communicate much better with their uh, fellow Swiss citizens than a German speaking Swiss can communicate with a, somebody from Austria or Germany. That is, there is so much commonality in, the, in their schooling so what, it's the what that they learn. And that's of course the focus of my book. And it's the reason I quoted Karl Deutsch uh, is that the real unity depends on the commonality of background knowledge, not in necessarily the language that it is expressed in. As a matter of fact, it's the, it's the language of knowledge and the language of value that's, uh, 
that's critical in tribal unity. Uh, and it's an interesting anthropological fact. And, it's a, and that's why I'm very grateful to Deutsch. So that's why I put him as, as the epigraph to my book. That's so that's why I would say, whether it's in Spanish or any other language in schools, they should be learning some of the same things. That is that's, that's quite it's, a It's the commonality of knowledge that's critical. Thank you, Ed. Um, we we have this question. Um, so, do we continue to have Department of Education, uh, the a, a Department of Education that would establish at least a bare bones curriculum, grade by grade, that the states would determine how to impart? What is your vision, Ed, for establishing the framework here? Well, I, my vision is that. The, the uh, Federal Department of Education has no legal power to do any such thing, and uh, uh, certainly not to enforce it, but the state departments of education do. And I think that, uh, here's what would happen. My, my plan is a, what I express in this book is a couple of states get together, and I know of some states now that are actually moving in this direction, and actually begin to define grade by grade content uh, for the at, at least a core of content for the elementary grades. What happens then? Their reading scores go way, way up because reading ability is knowledge dependent. It's not dependent on technique. It's dependent on knowledge. That, that was the insight from psycholinguistics that got me started. And so you have a couple of states that get together and their reading scores are better than the other states. Well, what do you think is going to happen then? There's going to be a movement. Parents are going to demand it. I think your parent power, once, and this is addressed to parents as much as to anybody else. Uh, have you got time for me to tell you an anecdote about parents? I, I think it's really, uh, I don't know how. <laughs> I think I, well. I think we do. Let's see. We we are we're 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 fine right now. We have quite a few questions, but uh, please go ahead because we'd like to hear your uh, excerpt. It's, also, it's just this: there there is this group of schools in the South Bronx. You know that's the poorest section of New York City. So, and you've got black and Latino and every possible skin color and every possible ethnic background, <laughs> and in in the Bronx. And most of the, the most of the parents are poor because that's why you're in the South Bronx. You can't afford to live anywhere else. And so there are these schools that are doing. It, it needn't be core knowledge, but it happens to be a definite grade by grade curriculum from the standpoint of content. And there's a chap, Jeff Litt, who was persuaded by these arguments, and who runs seven schools in the South Bronx. But nobody leaves those schools and it, because their kids all go to select high schools and then they go to colleges and they're all successful. And so naturally, every parent wants their kids to go to Jeff's schools. And uh, what, what happens is that he, since nobody leaves, he has only places for kindergarten, 130 kindergarten spots. And there are tw more than 20,000 applicants every year. So you've got 20,000 disappointed parents. Uh, and you know, if they had political means to do something about that situation, they would do it. And I think that's why we have to, it's the general public that has to understand the power of shared knowledge. And, and see the actual, I, I spent some time in the book giving some actual examples of, of course, how this works and <laughs> how it works internationally. All the high scoring uh, nations use this kind of, and they're all, their reading scores are far better. We are number 24 in reading ability for our 15 year olds. You use Singapore as an example of, can you elaborate briefly? Uh, about the PISA scores? And yes, the, yes. Well, well, I think it's terribly important. I mean. It's saying that we have the, the 24th best elementary system in the world. Well, but we're, we're rich enough to have the best elementary system in the world. And there's no reason, it's, a, it's ideas that have made that difference. 
And the idea, <laughs> I won't give you the whole argument of the book, but obviously, if we wanted to make our schools good, if the parents, if the public insisted on it, they would become good. And by the way, teachers also are on board with this. When they're teaching in that kind of school, it's so much more rewarding. This is, this is why I think the following question, good, again, dealing in the context of this awful moment we're all living through right now of Janine asks this question, do you think we, our nation, may unite around the importance of elementary education following the pandemic? Oh, I hope so. I mean, wouldn't that be marvelous? And I think parents, certainly the parents of young children now should get behind this idea. And as I mentioned, it's not really a commercial because it's not a commercial proposition, but they can get a good elementary curriculum to, if they're teaching at home, they can get a lot of help from the free materials that are available uh, from the Core Knowledge Foundation. Ed, how can you determine, this is this question from Lynn, how can you determine uh, this term patriotism? How is it uh, basically determined? How is it, uh, how do you come about, uh, uh, yeah, how does it come about patriotism? Well, a patriotism is a form of tribalism that uh, reaches across a whole nation. And it's a completely modern phenomenon. You couldn't have nationwide patriotism before the invention of the printing press. It's a, it's a modern phenomenon, patri patriotism. I mean, small nations which are very tribal in in tone and atmosphere. But I think it's important to keep uh, the tribal idea, which is of course, it, 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 except in the modern world, it's not based on birth anymore. It's not based on race. Uh, and that confuse, and we have a, a, a bit of confusion these days between race and ethnicity, which means culture. Uh, anyway, uh, Lead me back to the to the question. How do you determine it for a whole nation? Is that the question? Well, I think that's right, and I think uh, perhaps uh, if I'm not reading too much into this question, is if inequality is so rampant, how do you basically arrive at uh, at patriotism? How does one become patriotic oh. uh, given the uh, the the enormity of inequality that seems to be baked into uh, right. aspects of our culture? Right. No, no, I say it's based into aspects of our education right. uh, and th it, that part of our culture, because the inequality is based on educational outcomes mm -hmm. as much as anything else. Sure, there's race prejudice, but less. And, and right now, if, if somebody is talented, uh, if somebody has, is well-educated, they can do pretty well, at least a lot better than if they're not well-educated. And, and it seems to me if equality is the aim. The elementary school is where you want to look very closely because that's where life outcomes are determined. Ed, thank you very much. Um, this question from Greg, who's a teacher, he says, what advice do you give eighth grade civics teachers like me, he says, today, who are trying to navigate the tripwires of a lot of these divisive politics, honoring history, and trying to implore the need to understand and value our U.S. civic narrative? That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, th I think the civic narrative uh, comes first. And I, it, because as, as I've had to do, I'm, I'm constantly being asked now about, well, what about 1619? But I, let me just say that 1619, which was aimed at being part of a curriculum, it's a high school curriculum. If you look at the 1619 curriculum, you have to be pretty darn well educated to read the articles that are being required to be read. They're thinking of 10th grade, I would say at the earliest for uh, the 1619 curriculum, if you wanna get into the nitty gritty. So it's a kind of a rhetorical stance. If you wanna take it seriously, you had better do, a, a, a very good, at, 
job in elementary school if you want that curriculum to be studied and if you want those materials to be read. Well, if you do a good job in elementary school, you make civics part of what you're calling our civic narrative, which is an inspiring narrative, part of what kids are taught in elementary school. So yes, I would say patriotism first and then self-criticism second. Patriotism, I guess, would probably work a lot better if there wasn't so much revisionism. Uh, am I correct? I mean, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, <laughs> the, absolutely right. Yeah. Um, let, well, let, put it another way. Yeah. I would put it another way. I, I, I would say, and you cannot talk to a first class historian who doesn't see all the flaws. Every country has flaws, and certainly every, every country that had slavery has flaws. However, uh, you better get the history right. And that was a big complaint about the 1619. It, 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 you've got to be able to, the civic narrative of the United States is basically an inspiring narrative. It's true. I mean, all, there's a lot of complaint uh, of, uh, around now, but I have to say I'm 92 and that means I've passed. Is that right? <laughs> Incredible. I, whatever I you're, whatever you're drinking or having, man, you, you <laughs> share it, please. That's unbelievable. Anyway, <laughs> I passed through these periods when there was a great deal, a deal more unity, and a great deal more patriotism in the USA. There's nothing against uh, having it, but we had, uh, uh, we taught an upbeat national narrative, and I think, I think the correction of the flaws and the racism and the uh, uh, inhospitality to, to unity uh, in the United States is largely because we have no common curriculum. Uh, and that, that civic narrative does need to be taught as part of it, absolutely. Ed, just a quick observation, and then I'm going to go to our next question because we're running out of out of time, and I know we want to hear the excerpt also. But look, if you if you have the type of education that had been for years considered core, uh, that had been considered part of our civic uh, 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 inculcation, where kids learn about. Uh, the pilgrims and the turkeys and and the greeting, you know, like at Plymouth Rock, and it's uh, all polished and uh, and and uh, everyone's cordial and uh, getting along. Now, if they can learn that, why can't they learn the the if you will the the reality of uh, of the landing at, at Plymouth Rock? Why can't they learn the about the condition of Native Americans who uh, years right. after Columbus arrived in the Caribbean. And why can't they learn about 1619 in elementary school? Right, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. It's just that that particular curriculum is uh, is meant for high school. I, I, you have to look at what they're actually, I would put a, let me say another thing. There was not a lot of hard educational work that went into that uh, flamboyant thing of the New York Times. I mean, nobody, you are absolutely right. You can teach those things in elementary school, but you have to figure out how to do it. And you have to do it in such a way that people are upbeat and want to make things better. And I, th I think th that is perfectly fine. Take, for example, the insistence on including more Black culture in, in, in what we teach. I th think that's absolutely essential. But who has done the hard work of saying what Black culture is that the commonality that we should all learn? I mean, you've got to do a little more hard work than just taking these, uh, what, what do we call it, I ideological or, or uh, shaming kind of stances. And by the way, I think that, and that taking that kind of stance makes the politics so uh, terrible as 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 we've seen you yeah. know, all these people they feel they feel that we uh, well educated yankees are too snobbish and they to hell they're going to vote for trump because <laughs> because they feel political i mean this is a terrible idea we've got to we got to do a better job and do the hard work 
of figuring out, well, what is it we should be teaching in elementary school? Well, uh, ED, I think we're going to move on to some of these. Uh, I would say this, though. I think some of that hard uh, academic and intellectual probing has been done by people like Eddie Gold at, uh, at Princeton and uh, Pinnell Joseph, uh, University of Texas. Uh, and you have, uh, of course, uh, Skip Gates at, at Harvard. Uh, in in terms of their contributions to the 1619 project, oh but, sure, but, oh, but, absolutely, but they haven't done it for elementary school. Uh, no, I I, th I think that that is that becomes a question. This I want to see if we can get a, a couple more questions in because I I really want to hear your excerpt and. This is a, a question I would have have asked a few minutes ago myself. What was the most surprising thing you came across in in the research for this book, especially given your extensive background knowledge? Well, uh, the most surprising thing was this recent work in brain studies. And I've dedicated the book to two, uh, two dedications, one to my late friend, the philosopher Richard Warty, who wrote quite a, a wonderful book called Achieving Our Country, and, and the, uh, as well as others, many others. Uh, it, but the other dedicatee are the brain researchers who have found out that whether you're a black child, a white child, a yellow child, red child, a baby is born with exactly the same neocortex, a blank slate. There is no ethnicity in the, in the neocortex. They're all the same for all of us. And that any culture is, and the sort of the essentializing of culture is a mistake. You can have two cultures, you can have three cultures, and, and people do it uh, who, who have that kind of education. But everybody should have the American culture. I mean, I, I would say this book is a Biden book and not a Trump book. The, the, I mean, uh, the Trumpers are sort of setting groups against one another in the United States. This is saying we're all Americans, and, but that's determined in elementary school. The other thing, of course, is it's science-based. Um, uh, I'm glad you, you're explaining linguistics. I obviously had a very hard time explaining it earlier. And, uh, and that is a very important aspect of this book. Let's see if we can get a couple more questions in. This is a long one, but it's, it's an important one. This is from Kathleen. Uh, my question is, aren't all schools supposed to be core knowledge schools if they adhere to teaching their state's curriculum standards? In Massachusetts, we have strong standards, yes. The same ELA standards our skills, but we are expected to teach reading and writing across the content. Social studies, history, science are very explicit and knowledge-based. Not all administrators are good at or have time to ensure that teachers are doing this. It's more of a comment. What's your, what's your view? Well, that, that's a, that is a, a bunch of uh, assertions as well as a question. And and I do think that what you do want to, want to do and what we've done in the uh, core knowledge language arts is integrate the uh, content with the teaching of literacy. I think it's a misfortune that literacy is taught uh, by means of very forgettable tales and stories and so on. Uh, not, it's not Toni Morrison by any means. and and. It's that it, I'm having to participate in a in a seminar or webinar uh, in a in a few weeks uh, about the discovery that you learn how to read much better if you do social studies than if you do reading programs, and that is a pretty interesting result because, as you would predict, uh, literacy verbal understanding is dependent on background knowledge and particularly shared background knowledge. But I, that I can go into some detail on that, but we're a little pressed for time. We are indeed. Um, I wonder if we have time to hear just a, a quick excerpt from, from your book. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Uh, again, folks, uh, how to educate a citizen. Um, and, uh, and someone ask uh, if you, if, go ahead. Well, I chose three short paragraphs. Uh, the first, in case you're not aware of it, I, I, this paragraph starts us, and there's more bad news. The Program of International Student Assessment, that's PISA, 
issued its first rankings of reading scores in 2002. At that time, the United States ranked 15th in the world in terms of the reading ability of its students. By 2015, we ranked 24th. The nations that moved ahead, actually, it's not just they're moving ahead, we're moving downhill, I should say, if you mm. look at me. Uh, the nations that moved ahead uh, had taken note from PISA of their shortcomings in schooling and they improved their results and we continued downward. Just as a thermometer can indicate indirectly far more than mere temperature, so can a nation's reading comprehension scores of its 15 year olds indicate its economic competence and its social unity. That's an important uh, uh, point, the connection between those reading scores and social unity. Social unity it depends on shared knowledge, shared values, shared communications, okay? That was one paragraph. The, another paragraph uh, was the effect of the bad kind of schooling on disadvantaged students. Uh, and I think this is an important point in the book too. Lisa Delpit, a brilliant African-American black educator, I should say, that was, it shows how <laughs> backward I, I am, uh, had uh, critical things to say about constructivist methods in teaching African-American students in her book, Other People's Children. That's what they called them in the days that she wrote this, of course. She pointed out that the language of the classroom itself was often meaningless to black students and others whose language and shared knowledge was not that of the American print culture. And by the way, I think that's a useful phrase, print culture, instead of associating, saying, oh, that's white culture, or oh, that's like, I, I mentioned to you when we were chatting how that particular print culture has become worldwide. It's, uh, I mentioned Switzerland, but there are 24 English language newspapers in Bangladesh and, and I won't go on to my third. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Well, it's, it's not my time. In fact, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily interesting. I could talk about this all night. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Right. Uh, and the, and you, you're right. One of the more interesting ads, I mean, the entire book is, is intriguing, but you're right about the print culture, especially when you're de dealing with a social media culture that we're dealing with right now, where so much is framed uh, in that, which, uh, which where, where it's hard to find unity. Uh, a quick question that someone asked, uh, do you currently have plans to write another book, E.D.? <laughs> no, I, I, announced, I announced that this was my last uh, book, but, but if, if you're interested, I've written a lot more before this. That, uh, or the only new subject, I would say, basically new subject in this book is the brain research. That, I think, is, it's decisive. Look, it's an... Uh, Basically, it, as, as things often are, it's a, it's a, a conflict between two uh, views of human learning and the human mind uh, in education. One is Rousseau, which says you should follow nature. And that's the, that's the image and idea that our very bad elementary education follows. The other, was an even earlier writer, John Locke, who said, the mind of the child is a blank slate. And he proved to be right. There is no nature to follow. Nature is saying, follow culture. Nature is saying, do what you, it's like the 10 commandments, honor thy father and mother, do what the grownups tell you to do. That's the education in any particular tribe because they've figured out how to survive in in their particular environment. One thing, one thing I'll say finally, uh, and and we're going to have to say goodbye, uh, Ed, is that as uh, the issue of eugenics uh, uh, comes up again uh, in our national debate, we thought we'd way past that. 
Your uh, conclusion of kids having a blank slate, all kids, is something I'm hoping everyone will walk away with. And as a core uh, lesson, when you talk about uh, the brain and you talk about um, how to educate a citizen, uh, remember, remembering, of course, that we start off with the same blank slate as you quoted Locke. Thank you very much. Uh, folks, um, I wanna thank you, Ed, uh, for, <laughs> for joining us. Uh, this has been uh, absolutely ex uh, extraordinary. Uh, and I wanna thank you folks for tuning in for this month's uh, Beyond the Page book club. And, um, and again, thanks to Ed Hirsch, not only for joining us tonight, but for pinning what proved to be an enlightening read to say, to, say the least. Edie, take care. I hope uh, I see you again. I hope we can have this discussion again. Perhaps when uh, this may not, you may not write another book, but perhaps we can pick up again where we left off. Thank you, Philip. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you kindly. Okay. All right, folks. Um, jo uh, join us uh, over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our November selection, a work of literary fiction entitled Bestiary. I wanted to make sure I got that right. It's Bestiary by author K. Ming Chang, GBH's general manager for television, Liz Chang, uh, and uh, myself will lead that discussion. The uh, virtual conversation will take place on Tuesday, November 17th uh, at 7 p.m. Hopefully, we, uh, had a, when everything's calmed down. And you can register for this event at wgbh.org. Uh, slash events, wgbh.org slash events. And don't forget to also join our Beyond the Page uh, Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. Uh, and now another quick message from Sandy on how you can show your support. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know I could have gone on some more with tonight's discussion. We really hope you enjoyed tonight's event with Philip and Edie Hirsch. As mentioned before, the great thing about books and GBH is the fact that both are commercial free. And our commercial free status at GBH means we rely on your support. If you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member or $60 all at once, we will send you an autographed copy of next month's Beyond the Page book selection, Bestiary, as our thank you gift to you. It's so easy. All you have to do is go to gbh.org slash support events and click on that link and contribute what you can. Thanks for doing your part for supporting programming you not only enjoy, but programming and stories you believe in. Thank you so much. Sandy, thank you very much. Okay, folks, we look forward to connecting with you again. And we hope that you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this time.